everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was so cool. Good morning. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I'll make this announcement later in church. I may make a subsequent announcement too. I hope I do. Uh, I got a call, call, phone call this morning about three, three in the morning. Our oldest daughter went into labor this morning at three. Oh, that's so early. Uh, yeah, about a week and a half, two oh. weeks early. But not early, early, but earlier than we wanted her to be. We were hoping she'd, you know, give us a couple more weeks to get ready. You know. That baby ain't waiting on us. That baby so, don't care. nothing yet. Uh, she's at the hospital. When I when I was pulling up, she was at a six in her dilation. So it'll be probably sometime this morning or early afternoon. They don't know what she's having. The, the person who did the sonogram knows. That's the only person who knows. Even the doctor doesn't know. I don't even tell the doctor because they don't want the doctor to spill the beer. What the slip? Maybe like some offhand reference to he or she or something. So anyway, so a big day for us. And uh, hopefully, hopefully before we leave today, I'll... I'll no more. <laughs> I told her, keep me posted. Uh, the books that I ordered for our midweek Bible study came in. If you wanted to get one, uh, you're welcome to. Um, they're $8 each. I was wrong on the 10 that came on sale. But anyway, if uh, and if you want to go and get one and just get me later or whatever, that's fine as far as you know, paying for them. Uh, I trust you on that. But anyway, I think it's going to be a good book, a good study. Uh, looking forward to it. All right. Uh, anything else we need to, to make mention of before we start? No? Okay. We are on session five of six sessions. Session five of six sessions. So, uh, and I didn't make the handouts. I mean, I feel like I'm giving y'all a piece of paper. I'm basically reading off to you, so save a little paper. Uh, today we're going to talk about salvation. The hope of salvation, the hope we get from salvation, and what hope that promises for the church. Um, for us as the church. So, um, would anybody like to open this with a word of prayer? Gracious God, I just thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, I thank you for gathering us in your home, in your house, to uh, just to simply discuss and study your word and to reflect upon the reflections of one who studied uh, the hope of the church in, in detail. Uh, Lord, just ask that you'll guide us and be with us and may your spirit speak through us, through our experiences, through our wisdom, uh, so that we may just know you deep. And we may have more hope for our church, more hope for ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. And so we don't see too much of them. 
But when I look in a place like this, I think, yep, this is a place of safety, of security. You'd come in here, and whatever there were outside, predators, wolves, um, animals that might attack you, in here you'd be safe. Now, a lot of Christians think that salvation is like that. It's a wicked, dark world out there, but there's a place you can come in and be safe. And whether you call that place the church or the community of believers or whatever, that's the idea. It's bad out there, but we're okay in here. And of course, there's a sense in which that's true. Jesus himself spoke about a sheepfold in which he would bring the sheep in and then they would be safe there with him. But he said many other things as well, which make me think that this image of salvation really doesn't begin to do justice to what the Bible is actually talking about. salvation itself. What is salvation? Technically the word means, of course, rescue. Being rescued from an awful fate, being saved from it. It's simply an abstract way of referring to uh, something that happens when somebody's been in dire danger and somebody snatches them out of it and there, phew, you're safe at last. But actually, when we think about salvation in biblical terms, we're not just thinking about being saved from something, we're talking about being saved for something. And what's more, it isn't just us who are being saved, it is actually the whole world. In one of the greatest passages in the whole Bible, Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about the whole creation being on tiptoe, waiting and longing for human beings to be saved, because when that happens, Paul says, the whole creation will be set free from its slavery to decay and share the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, we will be saved from death and all that causes death, notably sin, but then the whole creation will be saved from the entropy and the decay which currently claws away at it and reduces it eventually to rubble or whatever. No, says Paul, creation itself is going to be saved. So how does our salvation relate to that and how can we properly think about it and explore it? One of the great biblical metaphors that helps us to do this is the picture of judgment. And in fact, when you understand salvation and judgment biblically, they turn out to be very much the same sort of thing. Because judgment is about God putting everything to rights at last. In other words, precisely rescuing it from injustice, from corruption and decay. Salvation and judgment, it turns out, belong very closely together. One of the things that many Christians today don't pick up on when they read the New Testament is that God has promised to sort the whole world out fully and finally at the end. One of the ways that this is routinely expressed is through the notion of judgment. Uh, for instance, when St Paul goes to Athens in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, it's a fascinating scene because Paul himself is under trial and looks as though he is going to be subject to judgment, but by the end of the great speech he makes before the great high court in Athens, he is actually warning them that there's a different sort of judgment and that it's going to be just and it's going to be fair and it's going to be done by the one true God through a particular man, obviously Jesus. And Paul actually says, God is going to sort the world out to put it to rights, to judge the world by a man whom he's appointed and he's given assurance of this to all people by raising this man from the dead. Now, of course, in Athens, and you'd find the same in Oxford or Harvard or any other great university city today, people just laughed. Raising from the dead? Don't be ridiculous. How can you possibly talk about a God who would do such a thing? But for Paul, the idea of Jesus being raised from the dead, and the idea of the world being put to rights at the last, were not really two ideas that were that far apart. Because what God did for Jesus at Easter was not just a random sort of conjuring trick. What God did for Jesus at Easter was taking his body, which had been very thoroughly dead, and sorting it out, giving it new life. 
passing judgment, if you like, on the court that had judged Jesus, in other words, through that passing judgment on all the injustices in the world, which were symbolized in what happened to Jesus. And when God raised Jesus from the dead, he not only said, this really is my son, he said, this is what I'm going to do for the whole world one day. I'm going to confront all the injustice in the world, all the misery, all the wickedness in the world, and instead I'm going to create a new world. And what's more, this Jesus, this my son, whom I've raised from the dead, is the one through whom I'm going to do that. Now, how did Paul know all that stuff? Did he just make it up? Well, Paul had undoubtedly thought through a great deal of this in new ways, ways that no one else had probably imagined before. But what Paul said was actually rooted again and again in the Old Testament. And when Paul goes back to the Old Testament, as often as not, he goes to the Psalms, which he probably sang and prayed like many Christians to this day do, day by day, week by week, throughout his life. And in the second Psalm, which many of the early Christians looked back to as one of the great initial statements of what God was going to do through the Messiah when he came, we find exactly this picture that God says to the one who is going to be the king, the Messiah, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Ask me and I will give you the nations for your possession and you will sort them out, you will judge them. You will condemn where there is wickedness, and you will uphold where there is righteousness. In other words, way back in Scripture, part of the task of the Messiah is to put the world to rights, not all by himself, but as God's agent. And that idea of the Messiah as God's agent, which goes back from Paul to the Psalms, goes back from the Psalms to something even more basic which is the biblical vision of humankind itself. When God made the world, he didn't make it simply as a random place in order to run off and do its own thing. God put into the world one particular creature whose job was to reflect God's wise order into the world. Imagine an angled mirror in which you look down and then you look out through that mirror. Or if you're looking this way, you look in and the mirror reflects your gaze upwards. God put into his world an angled mirror and it is called humankind. That's what it means when the Bible says we are made in the image of God. It means we are meant to reflect God into the world and to reflect now, this is a different point, but to reflect the praises and glory of the world back to God. So God has always designed it that the world is to be run through human beings. And when the world goes to the bad, as it did, not least through human beings themselves, interestingly, God doesn't scrap that particular calling of humans. He rather says, I'm now going to sort the world out through human beings. I'm not going to abandon the creation because it was a good creation, but I'm going to sort the world out in a way which is in harmony with the way it was made in the first place. How on earth is he going to do that? The answer seems to be gradually coming into focus throughout the whole scriptural narrative that God is going to come himself and be a faithful human being. And so the whole New Testament looks at Jesus and says, it's happened at last. He is the truly human being. He is the true Messiah. He is therefore the one through whom, in terms of Genesis, the living God is sorting out the garden once and for all, getting rid of the weeds and the thorns and the thistles and planting the new seeds of hope and ultimately enabling us to find the way to the tree of life. Now, this picture of God sorting out the world through the Messiah as the true human being is one which is then developed in a number of ways, and not least by, again, Paul himself. In the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul has a great chapter, chapter 15, when he talks about the resurrection. And he's not just talking about Jesus' resurrection, he's talking about our resurrection. But as the foundation for that, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 through to 28, 
he talks in great detail about how that final victory is going to be won. And he calls it a victory because, let's be honest, right now it feels as though we're in a cosmic battle. Often the forces of light and the forces of darkness are locking horns with one another. Evil often seems to be triumphing over good, and many times that seems to go on much, much longer than we would ask or hope for. But the point of the resurrection of Jesus is that the initial victory has been won. God has announced his judgment on evil and on death itself, and in Jesus is now going on towards winning the final victory. Because, Paul says, the last enemy which needs to be overcome is death itself. Now, here's an interesting point. Many Christians have gotten used to thinking of death as, well, that's okay, I'll die and I'll go to heaven, and that's the end of the story. That can't be the end of the story. Because if death is the enemy, then if you die and you leave your body in the ground and your soul, your spirit goes somewhere else, Death has not been overcome. Death has not been defeated. That simply is death itself. For Paul, the resurrection is God saying dramatically, this is how I am sorting the world out. And even the power of death itself won't be able to do anything about it because it will be overthrown and I will defeat it. So we have therefore developing in the New Testament particularly a vision of new creation. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, then there is new creation. And he doesn't just mean that that person is a little bit of new creation, a little bit of God's sorted out world. He means that that person is designed to be a means, an agent of sorting stuff out here and now. It is, in other words, a call for us to become people like the Messiah, that's why, because the word Messiah means anointed, often the New Testament talks about us being anointed with God's Spirit so that we can be sorting the world out people, so that we can be people who bring, in that sense, God's healing, creative, wise judgment and discernment to bear upon the world, so that we can be, in the image of Genesis, gardeners who learn how to plant the new seeds of hope and learn how to get rid of the thorns and thistles. One of the great passages where Paul says this very sharply is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, talking about the mess that the whole human race had been in once upon a time. He says, but now, by grace you are saved through faith. That's not your own doing, it's God's gift. Paul is always stressing that all the good things we have come directly from God, not because we've earned them, but just because God loves us. And then he says, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word for workmanship there in the original Greek is the word poema, the word from which we get poem. We are, if you like, God's artwork, God's poem, God's song, God's symphony. We as human beings are to be the people through whom God's fresh ordering of the world can take place. So when Paul says in that verse, God prepared us beforehand for good works or prepared good works for us beforehand, he doesn't just mean good moral works that we should do some good deeds here and there in order to earn favor or indeed that we should just behave ourselves, live our lives in the way we should. He means that we should be creative. We should be people of new creation, able to do new things, to write new books, to sing new songs, to plant new gardens, to do new building, to teach new things, that we should be people of new creation. That is the most amazing vision. When I see that, I'm astonished, actually, at how many people have an image of Christians as really rather boring, killjoy people who have some funny ideas that they believe and then they just go about trying to persuade other people to believe those funny things as well. Really, if Christians knew what they were about, they should be people who are out there making the world come alive, making new things happen, opening new possibilities, giving people joy, uh, bringing love into people's lives and, not least, bringing them hope. 
That's what the hope of judgment is at its heart all about, of God putting the world to rights at last, doing that through Jesus, but entrusting us, even now, even here, with the task of doing the small things that count as genuine signposts towards that ultimate reality. So when we're talking about judgment in this sense that Paul has it, that the Psalms have it, uh, that much of the Bible has it, we're not talking about a negative judgment in the sense of God just being capriciously angry with certain people and lashing out at them or anything stupid like that. We're talking about that sigh of relief moment when suddenly the sky clears, the clouds roll away, and God has sorted it all out. And with that, we know that we are rescued, that we are saved. So God's judgment in Jesus Christ is actually the means of God's salvation. And that means that we too are entrusted with being bearers of salvation by being bearers of wise, healing, creative judgment in the world. That sets us an agenda which I suspect it will take us quite a long time to work out. might tell everybody that you are a Sacred Heart singer and that Henderson is the where the uh, second largest Sacred Heart convention in the nation is held. That's right. And it was the hundred, this, it, well, yesterday and today was the 164th annual Sacred Heart singing there. And so, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty neat. But I was happy to come and be able to check out your church, what you're doing. I was telling them about the the idea of the new spaces is for churches just to say, okay, who in our community are we not reaching and what might we do to, to reach them? And to back it up, we put together a grant program that basically if you can uh, name who you're trying to reach, you meet regularly, connect it with your church, and, it's, and it has a discipleship component. We have a grant for $1,000 that we're ready just to, just to invest, and if it grows, then, then maybe you want to follow after that. But I, just uh, thank y'all for all that y'all do in service to the church. And, uh, I'll be sure to let Vic Cassad know that I was able to stop in and, and, and say hello to all of you, the district superintendent. And so my wife and kids, my two boys were asleep in the back of the car, and so we parked under your shade tree so over there. And uh, But I do thank the opportunity, Pastor, to be able to come in and say hello to y'all and blessings and have a blessed, blessed Sunday. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. What did y'all think of this session? I'm sorry I missed the very end of it there with you, but what was, what was y'all's impression?
I liked it. I mean, I didn't quite, I was having a hard time. At first I was like, what's he talking about? Talking about the slanted mirror thing. I thought, that's kind of, where's he going with that? But then I liked that idea of it being where we, as the Savior, a reflection of God, and then, you know, also shine praise back to God. And it doesn't mean we just get saved and sit back and wait. It's more like you're saved for something, right? You're saved for something special, a job, a mission, whatever you want to think of that as. Um, and I've heard, I've heard that before, that the idea that uh, there's work to be done in salvation, but it's not like, you know, labor in the, in the grudgery sense of the word, but labor in the joy sense of the word, we have something really special and important to do. Um, So he talks about the words salvation. I remember what he said that looks like or what that often can mean. What does salvation mean? You say rescue. Rescue. Yeah. Save. So it means rescue, right? We're going we're gonna, to you know, save someone. It means we're probably going to rescue them. And that's any way you want to use it, not just in this context. But any way you want to use it, salvation typically means, or not typically, it means, <laughs> look it up in the dictionary, I guess, uh, it means rescue, being saved. What are we being saved from? What are we being saved for? Um, or how does he put it here in his question? Yeah. When you think of salvation, it's not a right or wrong answer. Like you got to, you know, uh, parrot what what Reverend Rice says. But when you personally think of salvation, what does that mean to you? Before you even walked in today, you may have had a very different idea or thought of, thought process. You may still have. I mean, I'm saying you got to. You know, necessarily agree with what he has to say. Um, I'm just curious, where do we, where do we start the conversation talking about salvation? What does that mean to you? God takes us as we are. He doesn't try to clean us up, and then we become saved. He takes us with all of our shortcomings, our idiosyncrasies, and says. I'm going to make you a better person. That's what salvation is to me. It makes us more than what we were before salvation. It makes us better than what we were. Because we all have those shortcomings and we can't clean ourselves up. We can't be good enough or do good enough to be saved. God has to save us. Jesus Christ has to save us. He has to give us that desire to come to Him, and He puts that desire within us. It's not from us, it's from Jesus Christ, from God. He puts that desire, and Scripture tells us that we're not saved in and of ourselves. Not saved in and of ourselves, takes us as we are, makes us better, makes us more like He intended us to be. He mentioned uh, workmanship. I've heard in the past, uh, maybe in books or in different preachers, that word could also mean masterpiece. In other words, we're God's masterpiece. And when I think about that, and I say, hey, I'm God's masterpiece, it does something for me inside me that God would look at me and say, you're my masterpiece. I created you to be the one you are. How about when you look at someone else, do you see them as a masterpiece? No. Let's <laughs> <laughs> be honest. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> there are a few that you think, wow, I have aimed, I have aimed to be like people or do things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an inspiration to me. Yeah. I don't think I'm necessarily as masterpieces, but I can think they have it together better than I do. Sure. Anybody else? Well, what, what he said, the word, the original Greek word actually meant was poem, yeah. P-O-E-M. And uh, I think 
Uh, and you know, Peggy said she had also heard that it used the word or, or seen references to the word masterpiece. Uh, you know, there was a time in literary history when the poet was considered the greatest of all writers, um, and uh, just and a lot of people still think that's the case, but most uh, most people don't think that anymore. But this is a very old. Uh, literary piece in the New Testament. And I thought that was the most interesting thing that caught my attention, that the word poem uh, is, uh, is the, um, the word for workman, is the word on which the word workmanship is based in the New Testament. And I, I like Peggy uh, you know, pointing out that she had seen references to it as masterpiece. Um, one of the things that uh, Wright points out in the book, you know, is, uh, you know, getting back to Peggy's point about uh, we, we can't do enough good works to save ourselves. One thing that, that we can do, though, that he talks about in the book, and he does not call it a good work, but what he talks about is that in the judgment period, those who no longer fully reflect God are the ones who are probably not going to be to receive the kind of salvation that most people think of. Uh, and I thought that was, again, the most uh, fascinating way of interpreting it. Of course, I happen to think that <laughs> Wright is, is the world's best living theologian. And I just, I think the way he interprets the New Testament is uh, very inspiring. Um, I read probably every commentary that anyone could name in this church, and I've used and praised many of them, uh, but I don't think anyone approaches N.T. Wright on his uh, interpretation, understanding, and the way he can explain what the New Testament means. And I thought today's video was probably the best, he chose the best parts of the book. I've been kind of disappointed in the first uh, several of those, this is number four, five, uh, and I missed number one uh, because that was when I had to be gone. But uh, I have not thought that he chose the best of his work in the actual book, Surprised by Hope, to use in the video. But today, I thought he did. But to me, the thing to, that I thought, and when he talks about salvation, I think the key thing that stays with me is when he talks about those of us who may lose our ability to fully reflect God's image are the ones who are not going to receive the kind of salvation that they're, they hope for. Let's take a little walk down the uh, front row Spirit himself 
makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts know, know what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So there's a line of, I don't have a Bible in front of me, sorry. Um, is somewhere in the middle, I heard it, uh, he speaks about creation being delivered. Did you see that? Say it again. Something about creation the being creation, delivered. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption okay. into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay. So what do you... Yes. You said in the video, he said that judgment means God putting everything right. Yes. So maybe this talking that one verse right there also refers to what you were talking about. I like this is very English sounding phrase. You kept talking about sorting things out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorting things out. You want to sort it all out. God sorts everything out. So what do you think Paul is talking about when Paul talks about creation being delivered from corruption, I think that's how your Bible puts it. From the bondage of corruption. So Paul speaks about creation being delivered from the bondage of corruption too. And then talks about it being through those who were first called. Is that what it says? And also who had the first fruits. First fruits, okay. First fruits. Sort of this imagery of birthing pains and stuff is being part of it. Not necessarily an easy thing, but a beautiful ending to it. Well, at the first of the video, or pretty much the first two, said that God created, and because it corrupted, became corrupt, he was not going to do away with it. He's going to put it right. Mm -hmm. He's going to make right what was corrupted. That was what I also took out of that video that, like you said, he's going to sort everything out and make it like it was. That's what his desire is for it to be, the way it was, like in the Garden of Eden. He wants to recreate Earth in that sense. And on the Garden of Eden, what was our role in the Garden of Eden? Go back to Genesis 1. What was our job? Take care of the earth. Yeah. I mean, for, for, I mean, sort of a simple, simplistic way of putting it, it's kind of like you create us to be gardeners, you know, uh, stewards, caretakers, uh, you know, for that, I mean, phrase you want, taking care of it, tending to the garden. And then, of course, we kind of messed that up, and, and, and we've made a few mistakes since then. But the good news is, God didn't just throw us in the trash and start over, you know, like a, you know, Crumble, you know, crumbles up like a piece of paper that you know maybe you make some spelling errors on or, or something like that. And start over, he decided to let us to, to continue to use us to fix what we broke, to fix what we messed up. And so I, that's why I like how Reverend Ron puts it. We're not saved from it; we're saved for it because I think that does. I think it's very biblical. I think it's very scriptural. <coughs> Uh, continue to use us as instruments of His grace and peace, as, as tools to fix things here on earth, uh, to be His image here on earth. Um, here we go again. All right. <laughs> in most people's church experience, they are taught that salvation and judgment are polar opposites. <coughs> N.T. Wright says this is not the case. What do you think Wright is getting at when he says that salvation and judgment are similar? I think we all have been sort of hitting on this already. But you know, I mean, I know I was raised, and I think we all have this at some point in our lives, you know, <clears throat> judgment was a frightening, scary thing, and if you weren't right with God, that meant you went down to the bad place. And if you were around God, you got to go to heaven and hang out with the angels. That's a very simplistic way of putting it. But that, I mean, that's, I'm not the only one in this room who's heard that, right? 
Okay, just, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, and that's sort of a way of, we, we often hear of, of judgment. And so salvation means you go up, you, can, you know, you get to go up the escalator to heaven, and, and judgment means you go down and spend the rest of eternity with the devil. How does the rock put that into different terms? Saying they're actually one and the same, or they're similar at least, connected. Yes, uh, I think, and back to your other, other earlier question uh, is, um, if you are, if you receive salvation, uh, you have a future in the kingdom. Now he goes into great detail in that in the book, and it probably the last one of our videos will probably go into that in great detail. But uh, another thing that he points out in the book is that. Um, during the judgment period, human beings who no longer fully reflect the image of God will probably just cease to exist. You know, they will s stop being around. Okay. And uh, now he doesn't say that for sure. You know, he said that is one possibility of the way that it will work. Uh, and I thought that was the most interesting, most logical way of looking at it uh, and in other words that might be what hell really is is ceasing to exist because you no longer fully reflect the image of God Yeah, and his view of the kingdom, of course, is that uh, those who do receive salvation, mm -hmm. you know, will all of the many talents that you have had on earth but maybe didn't use, all will be used and enhanced in your glorified body uh, when you are prepared for the new kingdom, the, the new heaven and the new earth when they come together is that a lot of this is one of the things that 
very few other theologians have spent a lot of time writing about is, is how that new kingdom will work and what, what our part in it is. You mentioned separation. And I sort of, you mentioned separation from God. So I'll, this has stuck with me. It's weird how you know some things you, you see something, you hear something, experience something, and it just it just sticks to you. So I was in high school, stayed home for sick from school one day, uh, watching daytime TV. Came across the the PTO club, I think that's what it was called. It had uh, Pat Robertson and, and all his his hosts and I'll watch this. <laughs> and it was really an incredibly interesting episode that he had did three or four different guests who had had near-death experiences, but they were not light at the end of the tunnel, rising in heaven. They were the opposite. They had they were these were people who had you know sort of pitiful lives or no connection to God or you know whatever the case may be, and their near-death experience had been um, like going to hell. But time and time again, their experience was not hellfire and brimstone, it was a cold, lightless darkness where they felt completely separated from God or life or anything good. And to them, that was more terrifying, that complete and total separation, isolation. They said it was a blackness you cannot imagine. It's, it's like, I mean, this one guy said, it was like going, going into a cave and turning off the lights off would not be getting as dark as it felt. And then, you know, for whatever reason, they got resuscitated or whatever and had complete life turnarounds because they did not want to be anything they ever touched on again. But that sort of hit on that, that separation as being maybe what hell is. It's you know, not pitchforks and fire, but just lacking love and lacking life. Even on this earthly life, though, you know, one of the greatest punishment, maybe the greatest punishment that a person can get is solitary confinement in prison. I would just say that pitchforks and the other things that were more of you. Yeah. Misery loves company. Yeah. <laughs> if you're alone, you're alone. Well, we live in a world of ungrace. We see God's grace around us every day, but but we live in this world of evil, of unrest. And I know that's a strange way to put it, but it is. You know, it's, it's, we see evil around us every day with all these little wicked things that just happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Any choices we make? Uh, can someone read Acts for us? We're going to look at Acts 17, 22 through 32. Acts 17, 22 through 32. Then Paul stood in the midst of the hard work and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation and all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of all this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them was thy awesomeness and another person and a woman named Marius and others visit him. And that was Acts 17, right? Uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead on that first Easter, it was a sign of God's judgment on all sin of the world. It was as if God is saying, this is what I will do for the whole world someday. And Jesus is the one through whom I will do it. How is Jesus the one through whom all our messes can be sorted out and all of our sins cleansed? Pass that again. How is Jesus the one through whom all of our messes can be sorted out and all of our sins cleansed? Well, you mentioned God takes us as we are, right? Our messy... Mm. Broken, failed selves, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. How does God, how does Jesus, how does God take us and through Jesus make up? Because he died and we prosper our sins and only by us being covered with his blood can we stand before the righteous God. That's pretty big. So we accept God's love and grace because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Where do we go from there? What do we do after we sort of come to that, that realization and that acceptance and that response? What next? As John Wesley would say, how do we go on to perfection? Get back. to be a loving person and um, hopefully that prompts us, hopefully it shakes our conscience when we're not, you know, that somehow we're aware of each one of us just influence, have some kind of impact on the people. That's either good or good or good. I think you're right. I think some of just that awareness and allowing God to see through us, through our conscience, through our hearts. It's not just knowing what's right, it's, it's doing what's right. You know, how we act, how we speak, how we interact with the world. Uh, today we're going to talk, in, I'm going to talk in my message today about the Good Samaritan. And you know, I love this phrase I came across the Good Samaritan was courageously kind. Courageously kind. He uh, saved a man's life, but others just walked on by and ignored and, and acted out in kindness for another well being. Now, we didn't know the Samaritan's name, which is the Samaritan. We just where he was from, basically. That's it. And yet, he made an impact on the world, he made it a better place. We can all do that in our own ways, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, they really were not seen as, you know, people you wanted to cross paths with. They did not, they did not like them. They were seen as unclean and, you know, contemptible and things like that. And I'm not sure exactly what the grudge was, but there was 
I used to be able to explain it and I have to sort of got a little fuzz in that, so. Verse 30 says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. Thank God. <laughs>
you want to see Christians just bring joy, hope, peace, love, creativity, joy, huh? Is it not working? You don't see Christians doing it? Oh, oh, I thought you said, do we just do that? No, 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 we don't just do that. I know that. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but where do y'all see that? I mean, can I give you any examples, perhaps? In examples of, of you have witnessed, it might be right, someone sitting right next to you that you've seen bring a little love, joy, hope, peace, you know, Christian, Christian connection, Christian love, whatever you want, you know, sort of word that as into this world. And for that man to be with the district in his position 
and this is what we saw. I think it's a blight on the Kenny Chapel. And I may be speaking out of turn. If I am, I ask God to forgive me. But that needs to be addressed. I don't have something to address. I mean, somebody wants to come to church on Sunday morning and they say that. Is anybody there? Yeah. It looks like, from the outside, it looks like a church that is not a functioning church. Well, everything Peggy said is true, but I also think of, like, for five years I worked real closely with Dr. Joan Labar, Reverend Dr. Joan Labar, uh, and she had a way of asking a question when something like that came up, and it was always the same. Is it a kingdom issue? I say the lawn, the yard out there is not a kingdom issue. Yeah, it makes us look bad, but it's not... Uh, and I think <laughs> Bishop Wright, if he, if he <laughs> there's not anywhere in his book, but I suspect that if you ask him the question, is that a kingdom issue, he'd say no. Uh, I agree with every word Peggy said. You know, this is the way it looks to other people. Uh, I don't think God looks at it that way. But I think what Peggy's getting at is we want our church to be inviting and welcoming, and when people yeah. come by, it looks like we don't care. And I agree. We don't want that to be a reflection of the people inside. Yeah, it's 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 a bad reflection on Tender's Child. Uh, oh, the only thing I'm saying, as bad as it is, it's still not a kingdom issue, in my personal opinion.
contributing a little extra to help pay for that service. Somehow we need to communicate that to the membership because there were a handful of us that were at that church council meeting and heard that, but most of the people in the church don't know it would be nice to do a, a second mile giving of whatever amount once a month to help go for that. I think people don't even know that it's an issue. Yeah, they probably don't. And maybe a email to everybody is more appropriate than talking about it in the church. So it is understood that the harvest wants to do it at some time someone could give a donation and say? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be fine. I mean, and the men's group has that same option. They can do it however they want. You know, if the men's group wants to show up and mow and trim on their own, they can do that. If they want to do what the women's group is doing and find a way to, to pay Carlos to do it, that's fine too. And Carlos is more than willing. I talked to him about it last Sunday. And um, he's, he's more than willing to take care of it. Um, but, you know, he's been paid by us in the past. It'd be an, I think it would be unfair to expect him to do it for free. Too. Church. Okay. We need to readdress that in council then and make a different decision. But until then, we need to still get one. So I'm sorry, what are they? I think it was mentioned that they would like to have had we're going to have a real quick meeting after church today. Okay. The best trustees at this council. This council isn't. Man, I can't tell. Good work. Okay, well, let's bring that up to you. Surely someone will be there that we can get a second opinion on or whatever. Sanctuary, we're looking at getting a little bit of it. There's old home in which I think is what it is. New Hope, New Hope, New Hope. One way or the other, it needs a new roof, and I know they're looking at putting a metal roof on it, which will be more expensive up front, but less expensive down the road because you won't have to replace it. Versus a shingle roof, which would be cheap now, but it would be replaced for a while. So we're going through the process of asking Richard's going to be Yeah, and I don't, you may know better than this, I don't remember the numbers. Richard has gotten a number from the insurance company on what they will pay for to roof, and then he's getting bids from different uh, roofers, I think. Is that right? Gordy looks like it's going to be our best bid, okay. from what I'm understanding. And that's what I think we wanted everyone to see and how they feel. And to go towards the metal roof, which would be good in the long run. Yeah. So, I wonder if the metal roof would lower on insurance. Hmm. But, I don't think so. I mean, if it's a given, if you have a asphalt roof that's going to come off at some point in your place. It's just, it's, none of them last forever. Whether you're doing 20 years shingles or not, they don't last 20 years. We don't know how many layers are on the one that we have. No, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> but it is leaching, and it does need to be addressed. Y'all, it is five to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, let's close out with a word of prayer real quick. Do you want to like to, like, like to send us out? Lord, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for allowing us the, the concern for our church, concern for our congregation to, to wrestle with the best ways that we can present ourselves to the world as a church and the best ways that we can reach out to the world and the community around us. Uh, Lord, I pray that we will just continue to love one another and reach out to the world with your love. It's your name we pray. Amen.